Hello and welcome to GameSack. Let's talk about some criminally underrated games that hardly anyone ever talks about for whatever reason. On Twitter, I asked you what games you thought were underrated, and I got like 500 answers in the first six hours or so. Of course, I can't cover those all in a single episode, so I'm going to really milk this idea. <laughs> anyway, some of these games were already pricey before I'm talking about them, so I don't want to hear anyone blaming me. If anything, hopefully this raises awareness of these games' existence, so maybe they can be included in future compilations or virtual console type of deal, so everyone can play them far more easily than they can today. The first game I want to talk about was only released digitally, and I've mentioned it in that context before, but you all need to play this more. Hardcore Uprising. How about Hardcore Uprising on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360? The first thing you should know is that this is a Contra game and it takes place 20 years before the original Contra in the official timeline. It was developed by Arc System Works, whom you may know from the Guilty Gear games. And if you're familiar with them, you'll recognize the really clean cartoon look of all the characters in the game. Everything is animated like a cartoon, or an anime as they call them in Japan, but they're still cartoons. Oh, I wonder how many of you are warming up your keyboards in anger right now. <laughs> Anyway, it's the signature look from Arc System Works, and it runs in a native 1080p and at 60 frames per second. As far as the gameplay goes, it's an evolution of the classic Contra formula. Yeah, it's a run and gun, but it's not as basic as the original games. You choose your character in the beginning, and you can eventually unlock two more. At first, it feels pretty tough. You might not even make it to the end of the first stage. You have a life bar like in the Japanese version of Contra Hardcore on the Mega Drive. You can carry and switch between two different weapons and lock your direction while moving or standing still. But here's the thing. Each time you play, you earn CP, and you can use the CP to unlock abilities in the shop. There are tons upon tons of things to unlock here. I absolutely love this. It really keeps me playing. In fact, I've spent more time playing this than probably all other Contra games combined. You can even get stuff like a triple jump and the ability to deflect bullets and lots of other things. It gives me a reason to keep playing, and yes, it can be a little grindy, but honestly, I don't mind. You can pretty much plow through the game once you've purchased everything for a character, but by then, believe me, you've earned it. And it's still no quick task to get through the game, even when you're totally powered up. Fortunately, you can select from any stage you've beaten so far if you don't want to start from the very beginning. Everything about this game is amazing, including the hard rock and music. The only thing that could make it better is if it were available physically. Well that and I'd like it if there were a few organic bosses and enemies in the game instead of just everything being mechanical. I think the reason this game gets no recognition is because it doesn't have Contra in the title. I guess they wanted it to fly under the radar and be relatively unknown. The honest answer is that they wanted Hardcore to be its own subseries. But come on, they still should have included the Contra name. I mean, they've put the official Contra name on many lesser games. Regardless, this game really does need more appreciation. This is Mystical Fighter for the Genesis, which was developed by Kid and published by DreamWorks. This is a one or two player beat em up that's really never mentioned. I rented this one back when it was released, and it really didn't appeal to me for the same reason that probably doesn't appeal to many people. And what is that reason? Well, the main characters are Kabuki, which aren't really warriors, but more associated with Japanese theater. Who wants that? I think if it had samurais or ninjas or just plain random dudes, it would have had more appeal. Anyway, it takes place in feudal Japan, and you beat up several different kinds of enemies along the way. You have an attack and a jump button, and you can pull off a few different moves. There's a scroll that you can collect, which will give you a special attack by pressing the third button. Similar to Golden Axe, the more scrolls you have, the more powerful your attack. Though, they're never visually that impressive. In fact, that can be said for most of the game, though it certainly isn't ugly by any means. It just doesn't go out of its way to be anything special. As far as the gameplay goes, it's pretty smooth and definitely fun. Pulling off your moves is usually easy to do, and beating up the enemies feels good. I really like grabbing my enemies by their feet and spinning them around before tossing them away. Be careful though, because the longer you hold them, the more your life will go down. 
I also like running and sliding into my enemies, which knocks them on their futile ass. And it's fun to grab enemies, jump in the air, and then slam them down to the ground. I tend to lose most of my lives by falling off of an edge, and the game makes sure you fight by lots of edges. But don't forget that you can also toss your enemies off of those same edges. There are items that you can collect which will restore some of your life and even give you a limited special weapon. The levels never feel too long or too short. However, the game itself can feel a touch short with only five levels. Well, that is unless you play it on hard. In fact, you can only access the sixth level if you play it on the hard difficulty mode. The music isn't bad at all, though sadly it's only in mono. Overall, I'd say that this is a fun beat-em-up if you can get past the silly characters, and like I said, it can be played with two players. So grab a friend and make Japan feudal again. It also might have been overlooked because there were a lot of really good games for the system released at the time. Still, you really can't go wrong with this one, just as long as you're not expecting Streets of Rage. Another game that suffers from a similar identity crisis is Kabuki Quantum Fighter from HAL for the NES. Basically, your brain has been scanned into the computer or something and you end up as a fancy Kabuki because your great-great-grandfather was one. That's really the only reason for the Kabuki-ness in this game. Well, actually, the Japanese version is meant to promote a film called Zaipang which had Kabukis and they kept all of the character graphics here. Nonetheless, you are a Kabuki and therefore you have zero appeal to Western audiences. This is a side-scrolling action platformer where you can attack with your kabuki hair. If you crouch, you can do a kabuki punch. You can also select from different kabuki weapons with a select button, similar to the first Batman game on the system. As long as you have some kabuki chips in your kabuki chip meter, you can use them. After most stages, a new kabuki weapon will be added to your arsenal that's more powerful, but they eat up more kabuki chips each time you use them. Lastly, you can climb some walls and ceilings as well as hang and jump from certain objects. In fact, you'll be doing a lot of this, so take the time to absolutely master it, because this game wants you to fail. It requires very precise platforming skills. In fact, precise platforming and timing is basically all that stage three is. I really like it, except for these dumb ice blocks here and there. You've gotta be good, and really, I recommend playing on a CRT if you can, because lag isn't gonna help you here. Even the bosses can be tough, as their patterns are somewhat difficult to learn sometimes. Well, actually, the last boss was easier than I expected. The stages usually aren't very long, and overall the graphics and sound are average. There's certainly nothing bad here, though. But you're gonna have to practice to get far, that's for sure. How far can you get? This next game is underrated, and it even uses a ninja instead of a kabuki. In fact, it says ninja right in the title! Even among owners of this console, this game isn't highly regarded, but that's because it's barely even regarded at all. Here's the ninja on the Sega Master System. This is a very early game for the console, and basically it's an overhead run and gun, just without any guns. Instead, you're a ninja who throws a bunch of knives. One of the buttons on the controller allows you to fire in the direction that you're facing, while the other button makes you shoot straight up no matter what. If you press both buttons simultaneously, you'll disappear for a second, which makes you invisible and invincible. This is really good for dodging enemy attacks. If you get a red scroll, the music changes to become more exciting, and now you're throwing bigger stars, or pinwheel darts as the manual calls them. This is a much more powerful attack. The blue scrolls will increase your running speed. There are also five green scrolls that will need to be collected in order to find the last level, so always be on the lookout for these and shoot everywhere so that they appear. At the end of each stage is a boss fight. The bosses are usually the same dude and he's really easy to beat. This game is actually based on an arcade game called Sega Ninja or sometimes even Ninja Princess, which featured a female protagonist. There are also a lot more items to collect in the arcade version, though most are just for points. When porting the game home, they didn't just change the main character's gender, but also the music and some parts of the levels, though it's mostly intact otherwise. 
When I first rented this game back in 1988 or so, I didn't think much of it. It was a really difficult game for me and I couldn't get very far at all. It was okay at best, I thought. Then, maybe a decade or two later, I hear a couple of friends online talk about how much they loved this game. That surprised me, so I decided to revisit it. I'm much better playing video games these days than I ever was as a teenager. And I can mostly walk through this game now, but it still offers a challenge in spots, especially trying to find all of the green scrolls. My opinion about the game has changed. I really love it. It's definitely very fun. Oh, and if you're not playing the Japanese version of the game, you're playing the GIMPed version. The Japanese version has a couple of extra levels which were cut from the international release, likely because they wanted to decrease the cost of the cartridge. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of levels in the international version. I think this game would have been more popular if it had a better name. The Ninja is a name you'd expect a game for the Atari 2600 or 7800 to have. It's super generic. But seriously, try it out. The game itself is not generic. This is El Shaddai Ascension of the Metatron, which was released on the PS3 and Xbox 360. This is a hack and slash style action game mostly. It's got flavors of God of War and even a super small dash of Devil May Cry. Story wise, it's kind of the opposite of Dante's Inferno. You're on a mission to bring the fallen angels back to heaven. As you take damage, you lose your armor, but of course there are power ups to help you get it back. If you die, you can tap the jump and attack buttons together quickly to revive. You can also absorb red flamey things. According to the game, these help raise your abilities. You have three different weapons you can use. You can steal them from enemies after delivering enough damage to stun them for a bit, or you can get them from certain icons here and there. The first is a blade type of weapon called the arch. This is probably my favorite one to use since it's so fun. The gale is a weird thing that shoots projectiles and honestly, it's kind of a pain to use. I really don't like it much at all. The last one is called Veil, which is more of a melee type punching attack, and it's super strong. Of course, each weapon has its advantages against certain types of enemies. There are plenty of different moves that you can do with each weapon as well. This is one of those games where you need to wait for the animation to finish before you can do anything else. It's one of the calling cards of this particular generation of games, I think, though certainly not the only one which has this issue. The enemies have this issue as well, so it can be tough to escape their attacks if you're caught in one of their animations. It doesn't bring the game down much, and it's still extremely fun to play. It's also really confusing at times. Like, here, it's showing the credits, but I'm supposed to be fighting my way to the right. It took me a little bit to actually figure this out. And, as you've likely already noticed, the game's visuals are absolutely outstanding. The stylistic design is second to none, and at no point does the game ever look boring or average. There are lots of 2D segments interspersed throughout, and even these are a sight to behold. There's an amazing use of color and it's just all around very well done. The music and sound are also done well with lots of choirs and the like. And Jason Isaacs provides the voice for your buddy Lucifer who literally talks to God on a cell phone for you. Yeah, we got ourselves a situation. We just gotta trust him. Okay, talk to you later. The game itself can get a touch repetitive, but I always found myself wanting to get further and further just to see what the next area looks like. I'd really like to see this game remade with 4K visuals running at 60 frames per second on the PlayStation 5 or the Xbox 2Y or whatever they end up calling it. I think a lot of the reason this game isn't spoken of very much is its name. A title like El Shaddai Ascension of Metatron isn't exactly something that'll stick in your memory. I don't even know why it has a subtitle, that only serves to cause more confusion. It was originally going to be called Angelic, which I feel is a better name. Not the best name, but definitely a better name. Oh well, it doesn't matter now and there's nothing we can do about it. Just be sure to check this crazy game out. You could clear this in seven hours, if you're good enough.
This odd game is called Silent Bomber and it was brought to the PlayStation in 2000 from CyberConnect and Bandai. This game feels like a cross between Bomberman and maybe Burning Rangers? I'm not sure where the Burning Rangers vibe comes from, but it's definitely there. Maybe it's the people constantly talking to you, or the aesthetic of the character, or all the fire. Otherwise, it plays like you'd expect a Bomberman action game to play. You're a dude who runs around and your main attack is dropping a bomb on the ground. You detonate it with a different button, but you've got to make sure you're clear of the blast area if you don't want to get hurt. You can also hold the button down to lock onto enemies and toss a sticky bomb at them and then blow it up. You have secondary powers like napalm and paralysis which you can use the same way as you use your bombs. Be careful though as you only have a limited number of these. You can also jump and dash. At first, you can only lay down two bombs at a time, but as you collect more and more E-chips, you'll be able to drop many more simultaneously. The enemies come at you non-stop, so really, you want to keep moving. Just run past them, lay a bunch of bombs, and then detonate them. The controls take some getting used to since you need to use two different buttons each time you attack, but it doesn't take too long. It gets pretty fun and action-packed, that's for sure. You'll often have specific targets that you need to take down before the game lets you move on. The stages can get pretty big and you only have one life. And the bosses have life bars, which is a good thing because these fights can take a while. The graphics aren't anything special for the system, in fact they're quite bland and colorless. But they get the job done, I guess, and that doesn't mean that you won't have fun. The sound and music are good, but again, nothing exceptional. There's also some full motion video with some cheesy CG between some of the stages if you're into the goofy story. And the story can be summed up with this line. My only duty is to destroy my designated target. I'm concerned with nothing else. I mean, that's really all you need to know. When it comes down to it, this is an awesome game that could perhaps use more checkpoints and color. It came out when the Dreamcast was already making everything else look bad and the hype for the PS2 was gearing up. Check it out. Okay, I don't even know how to seg into the next game. It's incredibly overlooked. I mean, I own it, but I often forget that it even exists. But if you give it a chance, it's pretty fun. And another one of the games that are in this upcoming segment, I initially didn't care much for, but now I really like it. So check it out. Why the hell did I do that? Another game you rarely hear anyone mention is Marvel Land on the Genesis from Namco. Basically, you're a strange little dude who's trying to save the amusement park from the Mole King. You're also trying to rescue the four fairies who protect the park. Needless to say, almost this entire game takes place in an amusement park. You jump around and you can defeat most enemies by landing on top of them. However, there are treasure chests with power-ups that you can get. This one makes a bunch of mere images of you called a spirit tail. If you press the attack button, you can swing it around and defeat enemies and grab items. You can also use it as a swing. Each time you kill an enemy, one of you disappears from the spirit tail. If you grab an L icon, you gain an additional U to the spirit tail if you have less than 8 total. This icon adds wings which lets you jump higher. You can also kind of float in the air by flapping the wings with the jump button. The S icon will give you an extra dude. There are also some bad icons which can cause you to lose a life or a piece of your spirit tail, so be careful. The control is responsive, though a bit slippery at times. It definitely takes some getting used to. This originally was an arcade game that didn't see very wide distribution, and I've certainly never stumbled upon one in the wild. They did a decent job with the port, though it's certainly downgraded as far as visuals go, but it still looks nice. They even kept some of the rotation in, like these platforms. Beware though, because platforms can rotate on you without notice and get you into some trouble. The music is nice, though certainly not among the best on the console. Memorization is key here, and fortunately you have unlimited continues as well as a password. It's easy to keep trying and trying until you get it right, if you have the patience. There are four worlds with seven stages each, not counting the bosses. In many stages, you can find warps to other stages or even different places in the same round. These can be essential sometimes, so be sure to remember where the best ones are. The boss stages are all unique and don't feature a typical battle. Instead, you need to play their little mini-game. 
I like the bonus stages after you beat a boss since they feature a bunch of characters from different Namco games. If you're up for the challenge, I definitely recommend this one. One game that's certainly not unknown but you never hear much about these days is Shatterhand from Natsume and Jalico on the NES. This was released at the end of 1991 after the Super NES was already out, so it's no wonder it got overlooked. Anyway, check out the cover for this game. How could you not buy that? Who wouldn't want to be friends with this guy? The good news is that you get to play as him and experience a typical day in his life punching things to death with his bare fists. That's right, fisticuffs are your favorite method of attack and that means your range is short. The bad guys don't care though and they'll constantly shoot at you. After you get past the intro stage, you can choose from the next five areas, Mega Man style. As you wander through each stage, there are boxes that you can punch open. Sometimes these contain the Greek symbol for Alpha or Beta. You can change which symbol they represent by punching them because punching is how you deal with every facet of your life. Once you collect three of these, a little robot buddy comes down and helps you out for a while. And depending on the order in which you collected the alpha and beta symbols, you get a different style of robotic attack. There's a total of eight different attack styles, and it's always fun to see what a new combination does. You can also collect coins from boxes and defeated enemies. You use these at various platforms which can affect you and the price is listed right on the pedestal. 100 coins changes your color and doubles your attack power. Since most enemies take tons upon tons of hits, you absolutely want this. 300 coins restores your health bar. These are often found right in the nick of time. Lastly, 2,000 coins will get you an extra dude, and you'll probably be needing this too since the game is no cakewalk. Yeah, it's tough, but fortunately you have unlimited continues, so you always want to keep trying. I really like the graphics in this one. They're very detailed. One of the stages even has some nice parallax scrolling. Sometimes a stage will throw something crazy at you, like flipping upside down. This will remind you a lot of Metal Storm if you played that one. You can also climb fences, and it can be a little awkward to fight enemies this way, but it doesn't take long to get used to. The music is good, and it never gets on your nerves, but it's nowhere near as good as some of the classics on the system like Batman or Mega Man 2, for example. But honestly, the game itself deserves to be ranked up there with the likes of Batman, or at least well above the likes of Bayou Billy. The only real change that I'd make is to reduce the amount of damage that the normal stage enemies can take. But seriously, this is definitely in the upper echelon of NES games. Finally is Super Adventure Island 2 from Hudson on the Super Nintendo. I imagine that this one gets overlooked mainly because it's radically different than all the other Adventure Island games. In fact, this one feels like Hudson was going for a Monster World type of approach. A lot of people are put off when they first try it. And I admit, I was one of those people. But at the urging of some viewers, I've revisited it and you know what? It really is worth playing. Basically, you're honeymooning with your wife whom you just rescued from the first Super Adventure Island game. Suddenly, a storm happens. You both lose your memories and wash up in different places. She gets kidnapped and, yeah, once again, you have to rescue her. This one is kind of RPG-ish with money to collect and even random battles. There's an overworld where you make your way to new islands on a raft. This is where the random battles happen. You don't have any experience to gain, just coins and potions to collect. Sometimes a random battle won't even yield any tangible results. Honestly, the random battles don't really do much for the game, but at least they're super quick. There are plenty of places to visit on the map ranging from entire islands to single rooms. You'll eventually find and be able to equip weapons and armor. Each island stage is large and very cryptic, needing you to eventually gain an ability or move a switch to proceed. As you may know, I don't really care for puzzle platformers, but I don't really consider this to be in that genre. It doesn't overdo it to death like the recent Monster Boy does. It's just right and not annoying at all. The toughest thing is remembering where these places you previously couldn't get to were because you'll need to do some backtracking. The action is fun and responsive. 
The biggest issue is that the enemies respawn once their initial place gets even a pixel off the screen, but it's never overwhelming or anything. The visuals are done quite well with plenty of nice colors. Even the music is great in both composition and sound quality. Highly listenable stuff here that doesn't overuse reverb or sound muffled in the least. I never even heard about this one back when it was released as nobody seemed to give it much coverage, likely because there were so many bigger games coming out at the time. Overall, I'm glad I tried this game again and you should check it out for yourself. Okay, so those are nine games that are criminally underrated that need more attention and love. Like I said, I've got more games for future episodes of this, but why don't you let me know what games you think are underrated and maybe I'll include your game in the next one of these episodes and bump someone else's suggestion off because it was crap! So let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSec. I can't cut to the credits until the music swells up. Brian, can you swell the music up so we can go to the credits, please? It's over. Mr. Brimaxian. He plays the music live for each and every individual episode. It's not like I have this pre-recorded and can fully control it during editing or anything. Brian, hello. Oh, finally about time, here we go. A couple of people recommended Tube Slider on the GameCube as a criminally underrated game. Well, I doubt it's criminally underrated. In fact, I bet it's justifiably rated. Let's find out together. <laughs> Tube Slider. Let me just slide this into the GameCube's tube and get this going. Man, what kind of broken ass F Zero nonsense is this? Well, the graphics are okay, I guess. And the controls are adequate. Listen to those nasty sound effects, though. Ugh. What's more is you simply cannot lose on the first session. There's no challenge at all. But on the second session, you can't even place because it's so damn unbalanced. And it's not fun because you're playing the same tracks as you did in the first session over and over and over again. Well, it turns out the game is properly named. It makes me need to slide something out of my own tube.